Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor and I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador. This is my review of Sony's FE 16-25mm f2.8 G wide angle zoom lens. Now many people might be thinking, do we really need another wide angle zoom from Sony? So this lens review is going to show you how this particular product fits into Sony's existing lens lineup. Okay, so without much further ado, let's get started. The best way I can describe this lens is that it is a compact f2.8 wide angle zoom lens and is going to be of most interest to those photographers looking for maximum optical performance for the minimum physical size where form factor is their main priority, possibly because they're working with more compact bodies and possibly because they're working handheld for the majority of the day, whether it's shooting stills or movies. Now, I think it's going to be of most interest to those photographers who may be looking at the more compact cameras, such as the Alpha 7C II, the Alpha 7CR, the ZVE1, maybe even the Alpha 6700 for those photographers who are mixing APS-C and full frame bodies. Now I have a range of ebooks available on my support site for all of these uh, late model cameras and so you'll be able to go over to my website if you're looking to be able to master uh, your camera. So head over to patreon.com forward slash Mark if you want additional support after watching this video. Now another way of describing this uh, 1625 wide angle zoom is that it is a companion lens for the lens that's so only released a little bit earlier than this one, which is their FE2450 f2.8G. You'll see it's a very similar physical size and weight. It shares the same filter diameter. It even shares the same hood. So this fits into a range of lenses of a very similar size for photography. So hopefully this uh, gives you an understanding of why Sony are creating these lenses. There may be a little bit of an overlap with existing lenses, but you can see from this uh, illustration here, we have a range of GM wide aperture primes and G zoom lenses, and also that G 20 millimeter wide angle prime there. And you'll see that they're all a similar physical size, all sharing that 67 millimeter filter thread. Now this is going to be of major importance for people who may be working on gimbals and want the minimum amount of fuss when changing lenses. Now a lot of photographers will be thinking well there's a lot of 16 35 millimeter lenses out there why should I be looking at the 16 25 now possibly uh, I can cut to the chase here and say that this lens is basically a half price GM lens if we compare it to the 16 35 now I have to say that to looking back over all of the images that I've typically captured with 1635 wide angle zooms, 90, 95% of the images I'm capturing at that 16 to 24 millimeter focal length. So the question is, is why am I not using that 24 to 35? And the reason for that is often having a 24 70 zoom or I'm using wide aperture prime lenses in that physical space, such as the 35 mil f1.4, etc. Okay, so what is wide good for? So those people who are yet to acquire a wide angle zoom lens, I'm going to show you some examples of where this lens might satisfy the needs of many photographers. Now the first, the genre that springs to mind is landscapes. Now I'm going to shoot some urban landscapes in this particular review and this will allow me to showcase one of the strengths of wide angle focal lengths. This really comes into its own with urban landscapes and we can see the steep perspective that these wide angle focal lengths afford the image. They make uh, images very dramatic. So long as you can get some subject matter close to the lens, where leading lines, whether it be riverbanks or fence lines, or in this case, freeway overpasses in my home city of Melbourne. So as soon as I put in a hero subject in the foreground, we get those very steep converging lines there, which make the image very dramatic. This is also a good illustration to showcase the 11 blade aperture, creating these 22 point sun stars. And I think most people will be happy with the performance of this to capture these sun stars. 
Now the aperture, however, has been built for smooth bokeh, so we might get some examples of that as we move through uh, this uh, illustrations here. Now, one of the things that you will notice when using a wide angle focal length is as you tilt the camera up to get in maybe very high subject matter, you will get converging verticals. Now, a lot of people are happy to live with these converging verticals. I have to say that I try and um, eliminate or restrict the amount of converging verticals in my images shot with wide angle lenses as much as possible. So for instance, if I'm faced with this particular scene, if I try and keep the camera as level as possible without pointing it down or up, I can create verticals that are parallel to the edges of the frame. Where I'm working in an urban environment and I've got very tall buildings, there obviously is going to be a need to tilt the lens up so I can get the top of the buildings in. And this does allow verticals to converge. Now, if I just zoom out a little bit more, I can do some partial keystoning in the transform panel of Lightroom to make, uh, to make those converging verticals less steep. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. The camera is actually pointing down in this particular instance because of my my high vantage point to this railway station, but I've done some keystoning in post-production to have completely straight vertical lines. If I return to this image of my motorcycle where we do have those converging verticals there, if I just show you, if I go into Lightroom, into the transform panel and I hit auto, full or guided, or do use the manual controls, I can get the verticals on the edges of the frame that are absolutely parallel, as you can see in this particular example. So the camera is actually on a, a tabletop tripod on the ground in this particular instance, because I do like to travel very, very light, but I can correct those converging verticals quite easily in Lightroom. Okay, so let's take a look at another use for the wide angle zoom, and that is interiors. This does give you that space that you're looking for or that angle of view to get everything in that's in the physical space that you're working with. And this was actually captured with the maximum f2.8 aperture at the 16 mil focal length. And so what we often find is if we're not really very close to the nearest subject matter, we are going to get enough depth of field, even shooting handheld at the f2.8 aperture with the 16 mil focal length. There are gonna be instances where we're getting that uh, steep perspective again, and I'm very close to the near ground subject matter where I may need to stop down to f5.6 and bring the focus point closer to the camera. I'm using hyperfocal distance in this particular instance here. These images I'm using to showcase this particular lens, I will put a link in the info section so you can go over to my Flickr Pro account. I am uploading these in ultra high definition. You can even click to zoom in to check corner sharpness if that's what you're wanting to do. You'll find, however, that 16 mil, the 5.6, is usually enough to render corner to corner sharpness. And this is uh, an excellent lens with that corner sharpness in mind. As I said, I originally described this as half price G Master. For photographers who probably are not prioritizing that 25 to 35 mil focal length, possibly because they have a 2470 lens in their kit bag. So as you can see, this is a really excellent lens for showcasing uh, interiors of buildings, as we can see for, of these images of the design hub here. Now, I will be making raw examples of these images available to my patrons on patreon.com. Here we are again at now the Central Library in Melbourne, and we're shooting again wide open at f2.8. I'm not ultra close to anything uh, in the immediate foreground so I can get by with just using an f2.8 maximum aperture at that 16 mil focal length. And uh, as again 2.8 even though I am a little bit close now you can just see how much depth of field we're getting. I wouldn't expect a corner sharpness over there on the left side but at f2.8 we can work in some quite low ambient lighting conditions with this uh, wide angle lens in interiors of buildings. Now looking down, no keystone correction in this, just allowing the converging verticals to create some drama in this particular interior shot. Uh, looking for lots of angles of view here. Now I will stop down in this particular instance because I want both the uh, foreground arch and the background sharp. Again, 5.6 or f8 should be plenty enough to get both of those elements in sharp focus. Stop down in this one to 5.6, but this one where there's 
there's nothing immediately close to the lens. Again, I can shoot this at f2.8, keeping the dynamic range high and the ISO as low as possible. I'll use this slide to segue into using this lens for capturing photographs that include people. Now, unless you're prepared to get up close and personal with the characters, they are going to be reasonably small. But in this instance, this uh, street photography image, we are getting a sense of scale and we are providing a focal point for the image if the Sunstar wasn't focal point enough for you. Uh, stopping down to F16 to get to the Sunstar as sharp as possible in this particular instance. And again, getting some quite dramatic lines from this ultra wide angle, 16 mil angle of view. Getting even closer to the people now, the moving the camera as close to that uh, open air chessboard as possible. Getting some steep perspective again, but also getting the people in the frame. I will try to avoid putting the people in the extreme corners of the frame because there will be a little bit of distortion because of the wide angle of view that I'm using here now. Now, this isn't the sort of lens that I would typically use to photograph demonstrations, parades, sports meets, but I'm just showcasing that this lens is flexible enough for that with that maximum f 2.8 aperture now i am zooming to the longer focal length here so we're getting maximum figure ground separation at the maximum f 2.8 aperture and you can see that uh, this lens does lend itself even to photographing half length portraits as we can see from this particular one uh, if I want to zoom out and use a slightly uh, higher angle of view here, we can see again we can get the steep perspective giving a design element to this particular shot of this uh, climate defender captured at Parliament House. But again, if I need that head and shoulders portrait, just zoom to the maximum focal length of 25mm, maximum aperture, getting that bit of figure ground separation. So this lens does lend itself to people as well as landscapes and interiors. Now is the time to look at the technical specifications of the lens. Now, as with all of uh, Sony's uh, recent lenses that they've been releasing, this is smaller, lighter, faster, and sharper than lenses that have come before it. So it, it does have that great form factor that people with the compact cameras are possibly looking for. Yes, we might sacrifice the 25 to 35 mil part of the zoom range, but for many photographers who are looking for that ultra wide angle zoom, they're most interested in that 16 to 25 mil focal length. Now it's not a featherweight lens, but it is nicely balanced on the Alpha 7C cameras. And it's just 14.42 ounces or 409 grams. It's got a good balance to this uh, lens on this particular camera. So it's a compact wide angle zoom as we've discussed. And here are the physical dimensions, 3.6 inches long, 91.4 millimeters, three inches wide, that's 74.8 millimeters, coming in at 14.5 ounces or 409 grams. And as I mentioned previously, it does use that 67 millimeter filter thread. So we're not having to invest in multiple different size filters for a range of lenses that we might be choosing. Now, I do admire Sony for downsizing the zoom. Almost every lens gets smaller and lighter than the previous version. So the 1635 f2.8 G Master 2 was indeed smaller and lighter than the original GM. But for photographers looking for more compact lenses on their compact cameras, we do have a choice of the Power Zoom 1635 f4G. But photographers who are looking for the 2.8, uh, this new lens might be of greater interest, especially for photographers not looking for that power zoom feature. Also remember that we've got a featherweight lens there. It is an APS-C lens, but that's the E power zoom 1020 f4g that comes in at a minuscule 6.3 ounces or 178 grams now if we're comparing that to maybe a dual card camera carrying the 1635 g master 2 and we're using one of the smaller alpha 7c2 or alpha 7cr cameras and this 1625 g lens we are looking at a 23 percent weight reduction. That might not sound too much for a lot of people, but if we keep rolling those weight reductions over our entire camera kit, well, we can quite quickly see that we might end up in a small messenger bag rather than a large backpack.
So we are looking at a slight weight gain compared to maybe rolling with the FE Power Zoom 1635, which is a lighter lens. It does have a wider filter diameter, but it is a, a lighter lens than the 1625 f2.8G. We are going to have to build a slightly uh, larger, heavier lens in order to get that f2.8 maximum aperture. So looking at the lens, we've got that focusing ring, the zoom ring, and the aperture ring. Now, there are competing lenses, but uh, not many of them will have that aperture ring as well. So there is an external zoom component. It is internal focus, but external zoom. But the uh, lens only extends five sixteenths of an inch or eight millimeters when we zoom out. Interesting, it does extend when we zoom out rather than zoom in. So this lens does feature all of the bells and whistles that we've been seeing with late model GM and G lenses, and that includes the AF-MF switch, custom button, uh, the aperture ring, the D-click switch, the 11 blade aperture, fast AF uh, from linear focus motors, fluorine coating, and minimal focus breathing. Now that those list of features is very difficult to match in competing lenses that you might be looking at. So use that checklist to see what maybe you're missing out on in order to get a lens at a lower price point. So just some features of this lens. It's small light. It's got a constant f2.8 aperture. It's got a reasonably good close focusing distance and it's got those linear AF motors. Let's take a look at some of these features separately now. We're looking at stacking filters, i.e. adding more than one filter to this lens uh, to build up the um, uh, maybe a neutral density that we're looking for. We'll look at color fringing, resistance to flare and ghosting, distortion, sharpness, and close focusing capability. Double ND filters. Okay, you are going to start clipping the corners by using more than one ND filter. Now, I was hoping that we could maybe stack two slimline ND filters. I often carry a, an ND64 and an ND16 or ND8, and I, sometimes I do like to stack those to get a, a darker filter when shooting landscapes where I want to smooth the water. But you are going to have to go out and buy a single filter that has that neutral density that you're looking for in order to avoid clipping the corners. Lateral and longitudinal chromatic aberration, more simply known as color fringing. There was none that I could particularly see. Even when zooming in, I couldn't see any color fringing to shout about. So I think this lens has got you sorted in this particular area of quality. Resistance to flare, as you've seen previously, I've been pointing this camera at a bright sun and uh, you've probably not been aware of any flare or loss of contrast. And I think this is an excellent feature of the lens. It does allow you to uh, point towards the sun and have minimal uh, ghosting and flare. You will find some. This is a particular example where I've been shooting in to get that starburst here. And if we zoom in, you can see some very small ghosting down there, which is actually quite easy to remove uh, if we need to in post-production. Distortion at 25 millimeter uncorrected on the raw file is very minimal. We can, if we're JPEG shooting, just apply the lens corrections in camera so you won't notice any anything that I'm about to show you. But as with uh, many of the late model G lenses, we are going to get barrel distortion at the ultra wide angle focal length. This is corrected in camera when shooting JPEGs, or you can pick up a profile in post-production. Because I'm shooting with a pre-production model here, I was picking up a lens profile for the 1635 power zoom and found that that had pretty much 100% correction. You could fine tune that perhaps a little bit more, but you can see that barrel distortion is uh, basically removed almost instantly by applying that lens profile in Lightroom. Just looking at sharpness, I have no issues with sharpness on this lens. Here it is at uh, maximum aperture 2.8 at the maximum focal length of 25 millimeters. If I zoom in to 100% into that corner, you'll see we have excellent sharpness running out to the extreme corner edges there. So excellent sharpness right out to the corners at maximum aperture. Now looking at 16 mil by zooming out again, maximum f2.8 aperture and again, zoom 
zooming into that corner, we can see that we hold on to that sharpness throughout the zoom range. And that is uh, particularly good for landscape photographers who are looking to shoot at maximum apertures. Another example, this is the old Melbourne jail, 16 millimeters f2.8. Again, looking into that corner, 100% magnification. And again, absolute crisp, uh, sharp detail right out to the corners once again. Now, close focusing capability, it does have a very good close focusing capability, this lens. You'll get a little bit more in manual focus than you do in autofocus. It's got a 0.23 times magnification. That's not as good as some of the more recent lenses, uh, which have 0.33, 0.32, but it is pretty good compared to competing lenses. Again, we're looking at uh, just seven inches away from the, the subject matter when getting up close and personal uh, to stuff that we want to put into the foreground. So I typically use this uh, two inch high Mickey Mouse to show how close I can get to fill the frame with Mickey. Now that main image that you're seeing there is uh, as close as I can get before I can't move any closer. So we can say that's just 1.5 inches to the front element of the lens or seven inches from Mickey Mouse's eyeball right through to the sensor distance. So you are going to get very close, just one and a half inches away from the subject matter. But of course, the uh, wide angle of view doesn't magnify Mickey as much as some of Sony's other recent lenses, such as the 2450 lens or the 2070 uh, zoom lens as well. Let's take a look at some of the alternative options to this particular 1625. So full frame or APS-C. Now, if you're using a full frame camera for shooting movies, then you might find that you do have options for shooting with an APS-C lens. Remember, if your preference is to shoot uh, movies at the 60 frames per second, many cameras have to do this in APS-C or crop mode or have a crop factor. So one of the options for some movie shooters is not to use a full frame lens at all, but maybe to choose that E1020 uh, uh, lens, which is obviously going to come in significantly smaller, cheaper, lighter uh, than the 1625. But of course, if you want that flexibility, now, and of course, there are some Sony cameras that can shoot 60 frames per second in, without any crop. And so uh, if you want to future proof yourself, then obviously the 1625 is going to be the one to go for. Now, F4 or F2.8. So obviously we're weighing up the um, decisions whether to choose the 1635 F4 power zoom or the 1625 F2.8. Really, it's a question of do you need the power zoom or do you need that wider aperture? So Sony have got you sorted depending on which your priority is. And they're both cracking lenses, in my opinion. There are obviously wider ultra wide angle zoom lenses. And these these are the two 12 24 millimeter lenses from Sony. So would you consider a 12 24 or over a 16 25? And the only thing I'd say about the 12 24 ultra wide angle zooms is they don't usually accept screw on filters. And that is definitely the case with Sony's two 12 24. So you are going to have to invest in a filter cage and use the larger glass filters to slide in into that filter cage. So for those photographers, again, looking to travel very light, maybe with one magnetic or screw on filter, the uh, 1625 is going to give a slight advantage there. Yeah. Some people will weigh up whether they want to use the 20mm prime or the 1625 f2.8 zoom. Now the uh, 20mm prime is a little bit smaller, a little bit cheaper and a little bit lighter. But of course we don't have that ultra wide angle of view from that 16mm focal length. We do have, have on the prime an f1.8 maximum aperture which would lend itself maybe to astrophotographers rather than the f2.8 aperture of the zoom. There are some wide compact primes. Now, I am hoping that Sony will join the Sigma Samyang uh, options that we've currently got available. Sony do have a, an ultra wide angle 
APS-C prime, that's the 11 millimeter f1.8. If we use that on a full frame camera, we are going to lower the resolution, but we will still have a 16.5 millimeter angle of view. And it is a very small, compact, lightweight and affordable lens. If you're looking for full frame wide angle primes, then Sigma have an f4 17 millimeter, Samyang have an 18 millimeter f2.8. So those are lightweight options. Obviously, the lens with the best build quality and the widest aperture, again, is going to be that uh, 1625 zoom. Now, I do actually like that 11 millimeter option from Sony. Even when traveling with my full frame cameras, I'll often pop that uh, into my bag because of that 16.5 millimeter full frame equivalent angle of view. And it is sharp corner to corner. And when I'm shooting uh, landscapes, I very rarely crop tighter because I want that steep perspective. So shooting with 26 megapixels on an Alpha 7R5 or Alpha 7CR is enough resolution for many photographers. 1625 or 1628. So we're going to compare this now to some non-Sony options such as the Sigma 1628 f2.8 DG. DN. Now we'll see that that lens doesn't have all of the bells and whistles that uh, Sony's lens has, um, but it is obviously going to be a slightly a more cost effective option. And we also have Tamron 17 17mm to 28mm f2.8 DI, that's the third version of that particular lens. You'll see that the Sony is the smaller and lighter option of those three. If we're looking at lightweight lenses, then obviously Sony's 1020 f4G is going to be the lightest, then the power zoom, and then we come in with the 1625 2.8 from Sony. So looking at 1625 or 2070. So if we're looking for a lightweight in the camera bag rather than lighter weight in the hand, then Sony's 20 to 70 is going to be a little bit larger than the 2450, but it does include that ultra wide 20 millimeter angle of view. So some photographers may not want to buy the 2450 and 1625 as a dynamic duo. They'd prefer just to go with one F4 20 to 70. So that depends on flexibility. I love the 2070. I think it's a really sharp and very useful travel lens, but uh, it'll come down to personal preference once again. And that 2070 does make a, a very interesting travel lens when working uh, with lightweight camera bags, uh, maybe 7L messenger bags, where we can get a, a range from 20mm uh, right up to 280mm just by combining the 2070, the 7200F4 Macro G Mark II, and a one4 times teleconverter. So that does give you a huge amount of flexibility if you're just looking for a two lens plus one teleconverter kit bag there. So if you are leaning towards the 2.8 rather than those two f4 zooms, then the 2450, the 1625, and maybe add one more wide aperture prime, which is the 85mm f1.8. That gives you a really effective three lens kit if you're perhaps not covering wildlife or action sports with your camera kit. Here's from uh, cheapest to most expensive. You'll see down there, the right at the bottom, we've got the G Master 2.8s, and you can see how much more expensive they are compared to the 1625 f2.8. And again, it's, I, I can't stress this, this enough, is for many people, the performance, the optical performance of this G is going to be enough. Okay, we're probably gonna have to look at MTF charts to compare the sharpness of this with the G Master 1635 too, but I suspect it's very, very close. You might want to just freeze this on this particular slide if you're looking for direct comparisons of weight, length, whether it has internal or external zoom, number of aperture blades, filter size, magnification ratio, and price. Now, the strengths of the FE 1625 is definitely weight, length, filter size, and those 11 blade aperture, which does create um, some remarkably smooth bokeh and is also good for those 22 point sun stars as well.
Comparing it to the G Master 2, we can see we've got a slightly better magnification ratio for close up photography on the G Master, but that does come at a significantly heavier and more pricey lens compared to the, the G lens instead. Now we should say with our high resolution sensors, we do have the ability to shoot in APS-C mode or do post-production crop uh, on the ultra high resolution sensors uh, above and beyond 33 megapixels, but you can usually get a two times crop in post, or we could use a 1.5 times crop in camera by just selecting APS-C mode. And that switches the focal range of these, uh, this particular lens from 16 to 25 to 24 to 37. 7.5 millimeter full frame equivalent angle of view. So the, I mentioned this because this is useful for those photographers looking at maybe instead of removing the lens on put on a lens that's more typical of street photography, you could just shoot in APS-C mode on this particular lens and get that 28 to 35 millimeter angle of view, which is what I'm showcasing now. This was captured at a 28 mil focal length. And if we're going into a post-production crop, we can extract that uh, 35 millimeter full frame equivalent angle of view from this particular lens. Okay, so just a shout out for my Patreon support channel again, that's patreon.com forward slash Mark Ayler. You can find all of my ebooks for all of the late model alpha cameras, Q&A forums, over 20 hours, so I think it's up to 30 hours now of member-only seminars, plus all of the raw files from my lens and camera reviews, plus camera setup files, which where I can basically set up your late model alpha camera from a file loaded to a memory card. And as you can see, I've covered pretty much all of the uh, Alpha models since the Alpha 7.3. So, and there's a shout out to my seminars, which are usually one and two hour uh, seminars on a range of different uh, topics. Okay, so give me the thumbs up if you've enjoyed this lens review and I'll catch you online next time.